It's bling, bring, uh, bling. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, I hope you guys are doing really, really well and I hope you're staying safe. Now that we're sort of all getting back into training, now that restrictions and things are easing up, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of get the ball rolling on this series. A while back I posted on Instagram asking, you know, what you guys would like to see. Workout related things, off ice things, or injury management and things like that. But this video is just going to be a general, um, a general summary of sort of 10 common things that I found uh, causing of injury or pain in figure skaters. I also have an Instagram, so it's at physio figure skater, wherever I decide to put it, I'll put it up somewhere. Don't forget to click the subscribe button so you guys can get notifications and like and comment on this video. Without further ado, onto the video. I hope you like it. So number one, that's two. Number one, lacing. Lacing is a very sort of personal thing for figure skaters and every everyone who figure skates knows that but lacing can often be the cause or the source um, of a lot of injuries. For example, lacing too loose, loose enough that the ankle and the toe, the ankle joint can sort of move around in the boot results in instability. So it sort of places you at more risk of sort of rolling the ankle or hurting the joints of the foot when you are skating. On the other hand, if you lace it too tight, um, you can risk something called lace bite. That's essentially when um, the laces are literally digging in to the tendons on the anterior or the front of the ankle. And that can cause things like weakness, numbness, muscular pain, um, and it can also cause things like swelling. So you're restricting sort of blood flow into that area as well. And then there's the uh, issue of sort of lacing too high versus too low. So you kind of have to find that happy medium and that sort of depends on the lacing options that you have with the boot that you have. For example, lacing too high, it restricts the ankle joint. So you can't, it doesn't allow for as much knee and ankle bend. But that sort of has a flow on to the hips, the back, and so on. For beginners, for example, um, like my Jackson Mystiques when I started, they laced up quite high. So I had a lot of stability around the ankle as a beginner, and that was good. I tried my old skates in um, this video. I'll, I'll link it somewhere around here. But essentially, it was just so restrictive to my ankle. And then the flip side is tying them too low. The lower the ankle and the lower you lace, the more freedom of movement there is for the ankle joint. That can also mimic what sort of instability is. So if the ankle joint has a higher range of movement, it does grant you better ankle knee bend, so on. And it allows you to make turns and maneuvers and do edge work that sort of high ankles or high lacing would not allow you to do. But if the muscles and um, structures around the ankle joint are not strong or or, um, stable enough, um, it can leave your ankle with a risk of developing injury. Number two, actually number two, the boot. There are so many boots on the market and depending on sort of the level that you're at, the boot that you choose will be very different. The important thing is, is to understand the stiffness, so the structure of the boot. So for example, stiffness is one of the first things that we look at in a boot, aside from sort of the shape. If the boot is not stiff enough for your weight or the skills that you're doing, the structure of the boot will break down and cause instability. So your joint, your ankle joint, um, will have to sort of pick up the slack and try and stabilize that ankle joint because the boot is not doing its job. On the flip side, there's having a boot that is too stiff for you. For example, if you are a beginner and you are very petite and light, maybe you're doing swizzles or something like that. Um, getting idea pianos, um, for example, is a little bit ridiculous. If the boot is too stiff for you, it can force the ankle to work in an unfavorable, inefficient, and almost dangerous way sometimes. Not only that, but it can place stress on the joints and the structures around the ankle. The ankle is not only fighting the ice to stabilize, it's fighting the boot. Your ankle is, is resisting the boot in a way that it's not really designed to do. And in figure skating, honestly, placing the ankle immobilized in a boot is in itself <laughs> puts us at a higher risk of sort of ankle injuries anyway, but even more so with a very stiff boot. Having the right shape 
uh, boot for your foot is incredibly important to get the right width in the box, the toe box for your foot. It doesn't make sense to sort of go a an A width in an India when you really require a D width or a custom, maybe an E width. If you end up getting a narrow toe box, it squishes those toes in um, at the balls of the foot. The important thing to note here is the anatomy of the foot and the toe joints. In those joints in particular, there are a lot of muscles and neurovascular or nerve and blood vessel um, bundles that run through those gaps between the balls of your foot. And if you expose them to repetitive compression, um, it can result in injury to them as well. As figure skaters, we all sort of know the feeling of having almost perpetually numb feet, um, even if our boot is wide enough, which is terrible, whether it's from sort of the cold or um, the fact that we're tying, we're lacing too tight. But this shouldn't be something that you should expect as a um, regular occurrence. If you're sort of losing um, sensation in the big toe and the little toes, even sort of 24 to 48 hours after you've taken that boot off, it might indicate to you that there is something a little bit more serious going on and that would be important at that time to contact a health professional. As well as you don't wanna pinch the heel too much because again, there are bony structures there. If you have things like bone spurs or anything like that, it can possibly aggravate those as well. And the same goes for sort of uh, the toe box, so the ball of the foot as well. If you have things like bunions or bunionettes, it can also exacerbate those. So it's important to really um, do your research on boot shape, boot stiffness and things like that. Number three, blades. There are so many variables that blades bling, bring, uh, bling, <laughs> bring into the equation. Let's start with placement. Incredibly influential on how you're able to perform turns um, and literally skate in a, in a line. <laughs> there are several ways the placement can sort of be influenced. First of all is just looking at the plates where the blade attaches onto the base of the boot. If those blades are attached flush, so if the mounts are flush with the bottom of the boot, that's really good. If, for example, the insides of the mount are too tight and the outside ones are too loose, you'll always be on the outside edge because the inside edges will not be flat on the ice. And the same applies to um, if the outsides of the blade mount are too tight versus the insides are not as tight, then you'll constantly be on the inside edge. And I'm obviously exaggerating, but it honestly makes such a huge difference. Another thing with placement is if one side or both sides are too far out or too far in. Another thing that is sort of out of the control of a skater is uh, deformities in the blade. So sort of issues with the rocker and if that blade is actually not straight. So sometimes the blade can be curved. Issues with blade placement and deformities in the blade, they change our ability to use our balance points and to judge situations accurately. And that leaves a big gap for injury to occur because we can place our trust in a blade as we normally have. And perhaps there's a little bit of difference in the blade placement that uh, doesn't sort of suit us. Um, we might go to do a high risk element and that issue with blade placement becomes more exaggerated and it can often fail us. And the last thing I'll sort of talk about is blade sharpness and that's essentially the depth of the radius of the blade. If we have a flatter blade, grants us more stability but less control of our edges. A sharp blade on the other hand, so a very deep radius, allows us very very tight turns, narrow maneuvers, takes away some of that stability to allow us to do more difficult turns um, and improve our spinning. There are pros and cons to both things as you could possibly imagine. So with a flatter blade, perhaps you're doing double jumps plus landing on an exceptionally flat blade is, so as soon as you take um, that jump and land onto that outside edge, your foot might just get taken out from underneath you. On the other hand, if you have too sharp a blade, for your skill level and for your muscles. The tight curves uh, will put a great amount of stress and demand on the muscles and the joints. If you lack that strength and that stability, that blade will keep going and you will 
you'll keep going too somewhere. Basically having sharper edges takes away sort of the glide. You would get more bang for your buck on a flat blade, just gliding, as opposed to a curved blade, which you would be having to work harder to get the same amount of distance. The reason I wanna bring that up is because you could be fatiguing yourself more than your body is necessary or used to, and fatigue, as we know, is something that contributes to injury risk. Number four, technique. I don't think that this one really needs much of an explanation, but I'm gonna go rehash it anyway, just in case. Put simply, good technique is good form. Good form reduces the risk that we will undertake risky maneuvers. I ran out of words there. The human body absolutely loves to compensate uh, before it starts to learn a skill. So it's important to learn technique as hard as it is. You don't want your body working harder than necessary to achieve a certain skill. If we have good form, we place our body at the best sort of energy efficiency ratio to do a certain skill. So compensating is actually a more taxing thing for your body. As a result, your body could be working harder and placing itself at greater risk of injury, um, trying to achieve an element by using parts of your body that shouldn't be used. Number five, weakness or lack of strength. This is something I could possibly go on a rant for, for like, I'm gonna put some stats up about, uh, or some papers and links about how much force actually goes through the ankle uh, when we land jumps. It's, it's an insane amount. And we're landing on that near zero shock absorbent surface. Our body really needs to be strong. And any sort of area of weakness is somewhere where injury is more prone to happening. There is a lot of plyometrics, so a lot of jumping, bouncing, uh, off ice rotations type exercise. Um, there's a lot of body weight exercise, but there isn't as much heavy resistance training. If you're landing at forces upwards of six times your own body weight on the ice, you should at least be able to sort of leg press your body weight plus. Um, and that's just a minimum. But I feel like that's sort of not as well um, communicated to people in the skating community. And I think that really needs to change. I think sort of that education around strength training and heavy resistance training uh, is super important. Our muscles are our shock absorbers and our force producers. So we really want them in good shape, nice and healthy, nice and strong to be able to withstand the stuff that we do on the ice. I think we're up to number six now. Number six, overuse injuries. Yeah. Overuse injuries are the most frustrating ones because they are avoidable. Overuse injuries are generally a result of overstressing or repetitively stressing tissues and muscles and ligaments and rah ra in a time period where there's insufficient rest. Uh, allowed or recovery allowed between those training sessions. For figure skaters, this can be things like overtraining, so training more frequently or increasing your training volume during a week without sufficient recovery or without periodization. So periodization is essentially a gradual buildup or a gradual decrease in training load. Or more commonly, this is something that I find more commonly with sort of uh, younger skaters or sort of beginner skaters is overdoing or overtraining a new technique or um, skill that doesn't exactly have the best form or perhaps you're still learning the form. Additionally, it could be skaters who are trying elements that are quite a lot more advanced and I don't sort of mean skill set wise. Perhaps they have the skills and the coordination to do it, but if their body is not strong enough stable enough, powerful enough, or flexible or, or mobile enough to do the skill, then it can 100% place a lot of stress on the tissues uh, in their body. Overuse injuries can be from bone, ligament, muscle, any of those things. Without adequate recovery or a proper graded increase or decrease in your training load, it's very, very likely that an overuse injury might occur. Number seven, age. 
Age-related changes are very, very important in determining risk of injury and also the type of injuries that someone is more likely to get as a skater and any sport for that matter. For young skaters, for example, the bone hasn't exactly formed. So for really young skaters, their bones are essentially cartilaginous. So they're made of cartilage. So they're <laughs> bouncy, I guess. It's more likely that they will get growth related changes. So things associated with growth spurts like Osgood Schlatter's, uh, Severs, things like that are traction apophysitis injuries. So that essentially means is the muscles might be placed under a high demand, but because they aren't growing at the rate that the bone is growing, it has to produce force and provide strength to the body. Um, but it also has to try and adapt to the increasing length of bone uh, as kids have growth spurts. And that can result in a lot of um, injuries in the younger population. On the other side, there's, there's menopause and sort of age-related changes. So with menopause and growing older, our bone density tends to decrease. If we sort of don't take measures to keep ourselves training and working out and not just working out, but doing the right kind of training for our body and our age, um, it can have a lot of detrimental effects, um, especially if there's trauma injuries like falls and things like that. Um, the risk of fracture is higher, for example. Gradually with age, it's more important to keep ourselves limber and flexible and mobile as best we can, because that's another issue. So restriction and stiffness is often um, a cause of injury in adult skaters as well. Number eight, fatigue. Like overuse, it's quite avoidable. I'll just say it as simply as I can here. Tired muscles do not perform as well or the same as fresh muscles. This is why we limit the number of times we perform elements or the amount of time that we're skating or training at a given time. Because if we place the same demands uh, that we place on fresh muscles, onto fatigued muscles, one, we will not get as much progress um, because fatigue, fatigued muscles can't apply technique, speed and reaction time the same way that fresh muscles can. But additionally, fresh muscles can support and stabilize our joints and body much more efficiently than fatigued muscles can. When our body gets tired of using the muscles we generally use in an element, the body will try and compensate by using other muscles which are less fatigued. And this not only results in crappier, questionable technique, but it also increases our risk of injury because we're not applying good form. Fatigued muscles don't have the capacity to contract as well or as efficiently as fresh muscles can. It's for this reason that it's important to find your limits, but it's also important to exercise within the safe limit. Exercising under fatigue repetitively, as you can probably guess, also leads to a lot of overuse injuries. Number nine, past or unhealed injuries. More importantly, training on unhealed injuries. This doesn't necessarily mean that you can't skate if you have past injuries, but it's more so if you are skating and training as normal on an unhealed injury um, against medical or allied health advice. Improper rehabilitation um, or going back to training too early is something that can place you and the injured structure under a lot of stress and at a higher risk, obviously of injury. And I find this with my experience is once people aren't under the influence of pain, they sort of start to become a little bit more like daredevil-y. So, and they obviously end up doing something hectic and chances are that either that injury um, is stressed and starts to flare up again or they sort of keep chipping away at that healing until that injury just blows up and they're like, nah, I can't move. If you have an unhealed injury or an injury that you've sort of had for a long period of time that sort of seems to flare up then go away for a while, then flare up and then go away for a while, it's important to get medical or um, allied health advice. Now, number 10, this one is a bit of a wild card because sometimes you just don't have control over this, but trauma injuries. For the figure skaters out there, you know that there are just some accidents that are just 
they're sort of freak accidents and you just don't have any control over them occurring. And the main one being when people at the rink run into you or push you over or you have to sort of swerve and avoid them because they're skating in your direction and they could possibly die. One of the dumbest ones that I've had is essentially I forgot to stop and I smashed into the barrier and sort of like was hanging over it <laughs> for a while because I was windy. But then there are also really, really scary trauma injuries, which are things like concussions and bone breakage or blade slicing. Mm, not nice, not nice. I've kicked myself in the knee with a blade. The tissue is still healing. So don't just go and yeet yourself into a double axle when you don't have your forward crossovers. Just the logical, just the logical things really. <laughs> So that's it guys, that was just a quick rehash. I hope it's quick, I'll find, I always tell myself like these videos are gonna be really quick and then I edit and I'm like, oh, that's 35 minutes. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it helped you gain sort of a bit of an insight on things that affect uh, injury risk and pain risk in figure skaters. And if there's things that you've found in your experience that contribute to injury risk in figure skaters. Feel free to let me know down in the comments. Tell me about your experiences. I would love to hear them. Thank you so much for your support, um, for subscribing and for commenting and liking my videos. Also guys, in light of the situation that's going on with the Black Lives Matter protests in America, if you're in a position to, if you are able to, um, please check my description box below. There are links there telling you how you can help or how you can spread awareness. Take care guys. I'll catch you next video. Stay safe, stay well, um, and I'll catch you soon.